Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my channel. And as I always start off saying, if you haven't subscribed, please do. And of course, hit the notification button so that you know when I have my next amazing interview coming out. And today is no exception. I am interviewing the lovely Mona Shroff. Um, Mona says she has always been obsessed with everything romantic. And if she's not writing, she's making melt in your mouth chocolate truffles or riding her bike or doing her favourite thing, reading. Alone time is precious, but Mona is just as likely to be raising a glass of wine or her favourite gin and tonic with friends and family. She's blessed with an amazing daughter and a loving son who have both left the nest and one is creating her own one now. And Mona lives in Maryland with her romance-loving husband and their rescue dog, Nala. So welcome, Mona. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, me too. I'm really, really pleased you're here. But, but the first question I have for you is, well, what is your favorite brand of gin? Oh, my goodness. So I'm trying all kinds of new gins. And I am learning that the gin and the tonic, you can have, they're completely different drinks. It's incredible. But if I'm in a pinch and you're at a bar and it's a go-to my go-to is always the sapphire and tonic. It's just easy. It's always available. It's guaranteed. Um, but I do love mixing and matching my gin and tonics. And I there's some places on the East Coast that I've been um, in the D.C. area where they they bring you the fanciest little bottle of like infused gin in this big bowl. And it's a production just to get it. And it's a gorgeous looking drink and it tastes amazing. So um, I haven't picked a favorite, but I will say that my safety gin is Sapphire, Bombay you, Sapphire. You can't go wrong with Bombay Sapphire, can no. you? No. I think you're right. It's amazing now how it's become a cocktail in and of its own. It is a sort of experience that you have now when you go to a nice bar and they do have fancy fruits and vegetables in it and then the, the special tonic that they, they make with it. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here to talk about writing and books um, rather than gin and tonic. But one of the questions I always like to start with is how did you get to writing? What was your journey to writing? Because for a lot of people, it's not a straightforward road. There's a few twists and turns there. And so I was curious as to um, how you got started. I, so again, I think you're absolutely correct. I think there's always twists and turns. So I think writing was always a passion of mine since I was a little girl. Um, when I was in elementary school, about fourth or fifth grade, they had a young authors contest where you wrote a little story and then some wonderful mom volunteers would like bind it up with like some kind of fancy paper and cardboard and you drew like a cover. And anyway, I won the contest two years running and I was very excited about that. And uh, all I wanted ever since then was to be an author. Um, you know, fast forward many, many years and it's time for me to go to school and go to college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being an author is not always the most stable or lucrative way to make a living. So I went down the sciences and I became um, an optometrist and I've been an optometrist for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And about, I want to say maybe 10, 12 years ago, I was like, you know, my kids were at a certain age and I thought to myself, you know, if I don't start trying to write now, I don't know if I'll ever be able to. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of started writing fan fiction. I, I started taking some classes. I wrote some short stories. Um, my daughter was a teenager at the time and she liked to read everything I wrote. And she kind of, one short story I wrote, she was like, this is going to be your novel. And it actually turned into be becoming um, Then Now Always, which was my debut. Um so I, I think I was at that for eight, nine years, just writing that and then learning about what a query was and trying to land an agent. And um, then I kind of feel like it was like slow, 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 slow. And then I landed an agent in 2017. By 2018, I had my first contract. 2020, my first book came out. And then from 2020 to 23, it's just been super fast. <laughs> So that's really interesting what you've said there about that idea of it being slow and, and then quick. And so over that slow period, because I, you know, in all of our heads, we want it all to happen now, today, tomorrow, yesterday. But actually that slow bit of doing the classes, doing the learning, it's such an important part where you get to make your mistakes 
um, write some dreadful stories without anybody ever seeing them, but sort of learning your craft as you go along. And so I wonder, were there any um, courses or any books or any resources that were particularly useful to you that are worth checking out? So many. Um, I, like I said, I was without direction. I didn't know any writer people at the time. And of course that has all changed. So I went to what I knew and I Googled Writer's Digest. Um, so Writer's Digest Online University has um, online classes. And I knew I, I, you know, I first looked at our local community college, but I, I knew with like small children and like my weekends were filled with sports and dancing and all that, um, I couldn't really attend a class. Mm -hmm. So the online option really worked for me. So I did Oh, I don't know, a few online classes. I think the first one I did was creative writing. And, you know, um, she just, you get an assignment from the teacher in an email and then you write it and it's due in a week. And then everybody gives you feedback. And I just started the process that way. So I took a few classes through there. Um, and then once I sort of realized I was a romance writer and I met some romance people a couple of years down the line, there is a book called uh, Romancing the Beats that I go back to time and time again when I'm stuck, what am I missing? You know, that was, um, that's one that um, I think I read cover to cover. Um, it's all bent up, it's got, it's dog-eared, like the whole thing, because I do refer to it off, often. Those mm -hmm. are the, and then I have those, like the emotion thesaurus and the, all the, there's a line of, um, I'm trying to look at them on my shelf right now, the the conflict thesaurus, the, and, and there's a whole line of those that help with, different like when I'm polishing um words and things that I need so yeah mm -hmm. yeah no I've heard a lot of people recommend the emotion thesaurus and that that line yeah they're really really useful oh that's great to hear then so um I think that'll be useful for our listeners to kind of give if they're starting out give them somewhere to go you said something really interesting there which was then you realized that you were a romance writer so did you sort of start off thinking you might write paranormal or something different I literally started off not having a clue what I was going to write my um, best friends like to tell the story about how I all of a sudden you know I had that realization that I wanted to write this novel and then once I had that in that moment I had to like shout it from the rooftops right that's just me um and I told my uh, best friends and they were like, well, that's fabulous. You want to write a novel? What are you going to write about? And I was like, I don't know. I have no idea. You don't have a story in your head? Nope, nothing. <laughs> so that was when I started the whole, like, let's do some fan fiction. Let's um, enter some contest. Um, NYC Midnight has a contest situation that, that you where they give you parameters and you write, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then I slowly over time, <clears throat> I realized that no matter what I read, um, whether I read fantasy, whether I read thriller, whether whatever I was reading, I was always interested in the love aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And if the couple didn't get together at the end, I was sort of very disappointed, um, even if that wasn't the main purpose of the story. Um, so I that's what I was like, oh, this is what I want to write. Like, I want. I, I've always, ever since I've read, I've been fascinated with the couple. So that once I realized that, that's where it sort of came to me that, oh, that I really want to write about unhappy, happily ever after, how two people fall in love mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So it wasn't something, it's one of those things where like, if you don't know yourself, you just have to go through a little journey before you figure out mm -hmm. what that is. That's I, what I'm saying. I don't want to write a thriller. I have a thriller in my head that I do want to write one day. So <laughs> it'll happen. It'll happen. Yeah. I'm thinking of um, Alessandra Torre, who starts it off. I think she still does write romance as well. Quite steamy romance, but now also writes thriller under um, a pen name as well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure it will. But I just think that's so interesting because I certainly had a similar experience. I thought I was going to be writing one type of story. In fact, I thought I probably would write more literary stories because I grew up on the classics and things. But actually, no, I write very, very commercial genre fiction and I'm happy mm -hmm. doing so. But sometimes it takes a while, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you, I know about you is that you're a triathlete. And my husband is also a triathlete. And I know that that involves a lot of commitment, a lot of dedication, a lot of hard work. And so I was curious as to whether there was any 
sort of overlap there or anything that you've learned from the triathlete world that actually you found to be applicable in the writing space even though to that to the outside world they might seem very different but I wondered if if you learn anything from either one I I think one of the main things I learned is what I just sort of touched on a little earlier when I um I did my first triathlon to celebrate my 40th um birthday so I decided at the at 39 so I gave myself a year and at that time I didn't know how to swim I'd never been on a road bike and I really wasn't a runner <laughs> So I don't really know what possessed me to do that, but I had this like feel, I had this need. I wanted to do this. And my husband was ever supportive, but he did point these three things out to me. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, but you know, I'm not trying to win it. I just want to finish it, you know? And it was like a, there was a women's triathlon in our community. Um, It was the sprint level. So I thought, well, this might be something that's doable. I just need to learn how to swim. So what I learned doing that was I had to tell people that this is what I wanted to do. So I told my friends, I told my family, and in doing so, I was able to get in touch with the community of triathlon people, triathletes, um, who were like, I, I would be happy to take you to the pool. You know, one woman reached out and said, I'd happy to take you to the pool and help you work on a stroke and, you know, build your confidence for swimming. And another, uh, my one of my best friend's husbands was like, I've done a triathlon. I'm happy to take you on your road bike and ride with you. So you're not riding alone. Right. And another girlfriend was like, I'm going to do the same thing. Why don't we train together? Why don't we run together? You know, so in actually, so being vulnerable and letting that out, um, I was able to sort of open myself up to a community that was very helpful to me um, in, in going on this journey of which I knew nothing about. And I just sort of was like, I'm going to do this. And I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I learned and I told strangers like in spin class, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And and so many people were doing it. So I think when I decided to write, that was one of the main things. Like that was probably the hardest thing was to tell people that I wanted to write a novel, at, particularly because the follow-up question then was, what do you want to write about? And I had no answer for that at the time. Um, But in doing so, I opened myself up to a community. A cousin said, oh, you're writing romance. I have a friend I went to college with, or I know from college, she just got a contract, you know, and do you want to talk to her? And I talked to this woman, her name is Shayla Patel, and she's still a good friend of mine. And she opened me up to sort of like finding like a local chapter of romance writers of which I didn't even know that was a thing, you know? Um, So I, I just kept doing that. So I think that was one major parallel. And I don't even know if it was a a parallel so much as I learned my lesson as a triathlete that I knew I had to do it as a writer so that I could find that community. Cause I knew it was something I couldn't, I could only do on my own for so long and get so far. Um, and then of course there is like that discipline of like, you had to go out and ride your bike. You had to go out and do this. I also have to sit down and write. Um, and so, you know, I used to ride with somebody. I used to run with somebody, I used to swim with somebody. So I have people that I am accountable to for writing. Um, especially when you're writing into like the void, when you don't have a contract or a deadline, when I have a deadline, I have no problem. I my deadline. <laughs> this has to get done and I'm going to make my deadline. And I still sometimes need a little bit of a push, but I have now that community, even though I sit in front of my computer by myself, I have a community of writer colleagues that I can touch tap into for whatever my needs might be, especially mm-hmm. since I don't really know the industry. I didn't really know the industry and I, I'm still learning like all of those industry things, you know? Um, so that's, yeah. that was, well there yeah you know I love that answer particularly the um aspect about reaching out and asking people and being vulnerable and I know that a lot of people in my audience oh my goodness they find that so hard about letting people even just describing themselves as a writer as an author as a novelist feels so so um it feels like such feels fraudulent it feels like they're being an imposter and they shouldn't be saying that they don't have the qualification they maybe don't have the story idea like you are in that situation and so hearing it from you who is now contracted agented doing very very well will hopefully give our listeners who might be in that situation the real encouragement that they can do that too and put themselves out there and know that yes that might be where you're starting but look where you might end up being 
if you do. Yeah, it, it's just that old, you know, the the older I get and the more I do this, it's one of those things like if I don't believe in myself, nobody else is going to. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I think it shows on you, right? So you have even if you're faking it till you make it, pretend you believe in yourself. <laughs> just pretend, just put that face on sometimes, you know. Um, I even even when I first started writing romance, I sort of was like, I just write love stories. Like I would do it like that. Like it's just a love story. And then after a little while of doing that, I'm like, why am I doing that? You know, I I met some other romance authors and I was like, you know, I think I need to really own this. And if the other person is uncomfortable with hearing that I write romance, that's not on me. That's on them. Mm-hmm. You know, so now I just own it. Then people ask me, I'm like, I'm a romance novelist and that is what I do. Fabulous. So listen up, people, you just own it. You've got to just <laughs> own it. I love that. Um, And so, yes, yeah, so things have absolutely changed for you from those days of feeling like, oh, I just write love stories to now. I'd love it if you could explain to us a little bit about your contractual situation now, because I don't think a lot of people um, are sort of aware of that a lot of this goes on behind the scenes. Um, so you are you have several contracts all going on simultaneously for different imprints. So would you just kind of talk us sort of the, the sort of basics of that and how that works for you? Sure. Yeah. So when I my very first contract was with HQN, um, which um, is currently called um, Canary Street Press. They just switched over. It was um, like HQN that that was Harlequin. So it's it was an imprint of Harlequin. Right. And Canary Street Press still is. They just they they just did a revamping and changed things, changed their name and changed the brand a little bit. Um, and um, my first contract was for two books with them. So then now always, and then there was you, um, in 2020 and 2021, were my first two with them, and then my third one with them was um the second first chance. What happened in as I debut I debuted in January of 2020, and by the end of 2020, um. Another woman, Susan, um, who is my current editor at Harlequin's special edition line. So if there's romance readers out there there or writers you're familiar with Harlequin's category romances, special edition is one of the older categories um, that's out there. Um, This editor read my first two books and then approached me asking if I would want to write for special edition, which is their category line. Basically, she said, can you write what you write, but do it in a shorter book? Um, and, you know, you don't say no. And it was exciting. And um, so I started writing um, for special edition as well. And I started writing my Once Upon a Wedding series, which is um, each is a standalone, each is a standalone book, but every book touches a wedding in somehow. Um, so I have, I think, four out a fifth one coming and I have a few more on contract with them. So those are like the 60 to 80, 70,000 word books um, that are that when you think of Harlequin and traditional category books, that's what they are. I do write um, closed door, but it's, it is still that Harlequin that you think of. Um, and that's what you're thinking about. So while I have those three books with HQN, I also have these other books um, with special edition. And a lot of the advantage to that was you get some cross promotion. So the special edition books come out quicker. You have to write them faster. They come out faster. I do about three. They come out about three a year. Um, so you're relevant. You're staying, you know, people hear your name all the time and they can promote your other bigger, the other HQN books and then vice versa. Mm-hmm. So as a result of, of writing for both imprints, that's what I mean when I went so fast, by the end of 2020, I was already talking to HQN. Um, so it's been three years, three and a half years, I guess. Um, and I have written 10 books. So my 10th book will come out next year. So wow. Four, wow. Right. And one of them is a novella, but it's still, um, I still have to write it. So, um, yeah. So by the end of this year, the one that comes out will be my eighth book. Um, and that's what I mean about it moves fast. And I think that I, 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 it's, it's definitely something to keep up with those deadlines, but again, did I, the first book I wrote took eight years. The second one took me about a year. 
Um, and then they were like, well, can you write a book in six months? And I was like, I don't know, let's find out, you know? So just kind of approached it like that. Let's, yeah. let's see what happens. Um, so the answer to that is yes, I can write actually in less than six months, I can write a book, which I didn't ever think I could do. I, I, I thought it would take years and years for every single book, um, but that's not always the case. Um, so it's nice to be able to challenge yourself um, in that way. So I do like that cross promo. Um, a number of my colleagues have that going on as well. Um, and that's kind of just where I am right now. Yeah. So there'll be people listening going, oh, my goodness, that's a lot of books. How do you do that? So how do you do that? What is your sort of process? I mean, if you're if you've got three coming out a year with one imprint and then say two coming out with the other imprint on a practical level, how do you manage your time and also your sort of headspace about what project you're working on at any given time? So the HQN or Canary, the HQN books um, come out more slowly. Um, they are they are ninety to ninety five thousand words. Um, there's plot, subplot, that type of thing. Um, and when I turn them in, they're you know they turn around a lot more slowly. The edits turn around more slowly. The um, usually the uh, release date is about 18 months out from when I actually hand the manuscript in. So there's a longer period of time there. The special edition books I write about every four to five months um, and they come out between eight and nine months after I hand it in. So that that um, edit process is a bit faster. The you know, sometimes even before I hand in the manuscript, they've already, I've already filled out like an art sheet for them. So they're, they've already worked on a cover and we start talking about titles. And I also think a lot because of the pandemic, we had a little bit of a push to kind of get things done. There was a paper shortage for a while and, you know, all these other things were happening. So um, special edition really tried to keep on top of it by saying like, let's at least have the books in place and then we can start release them as we need type of thing. Um, and how do I do it? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, if I have, if I'm drafting, but edits come in, then I will switch gears and I will focus for like, a, you know, depending on the deadline and because they're both within Harlequin, they respect each other's deadlines. Okay. So I don't usually have the same deadline for, for two different projects. I will alternate them or extend or shorten something so that I don't have to. So I can focus for a couple of weeks on like the characters in like the book that I'm editing, send that off and then return to the book that I'm drafting. Drafting is the absolute hardest part for me, pulling things out of thin air. Um, and I have found that part of my process is as much as I try to write and be disciplined about it, and I do write every day or I do something or some kind of thing every day, about three weeks before the thing is due is when all the ideas come. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't know why. I don't know. It's it's consistently happened for the past two or three special edition books. I write, I write, I write, and literally three weeks before, and I'm like, nope, delete, 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 put it in and start a new document move this over and let's go from here. So I'm, I, I have written about, you know, if the book is about 60,000 words, I've written about two thirds of a book in three weeks um, and then handle the mess in edits. And my editor is lovely and she knows it and she works with me and it turns out well, it turns out well. I just, um, I think what's happening is the way my brain works. I'm, actually just mulling it over and getting to know these people and then it, it's at that moment that all of the neurons fire and I'm like oh that's who they are okay you know um and it's not light and easy it's very stressful every single time every single time I'm like why do I do this why is my brain do and it's and and I feel like it's such a procrastinator but I wasn't actually procrastinating <laughs> I was working all along so um does that process work for everybody I don't think so uh I think you have to fit I I honestly when I started this whole process I thought I was a I thought I was a plotter like I thought I was gonna write these beautiful outlines and then I was just gonna type away you know no that doesn't work for me I wish it did <laughs> but it does I think that's um it's so so true and I'm really glad that you've kind of highlighted this that it is a messy process that it is hard work that it is stressful I think a lot of newer writers 
And I think I was exactly the same. And maybe I still am to a degree and get shocked again at how difficult it is. But we think, oh, if I'm meant to be a writer, I'll just sit down. It'll, I'll write, it'll, the words will come, it's me- it'll be easy. If I'm meant to be a writer, it's going to be easy. But actual fact, that's not necessarily true. And the reason not everybody writes their book is because it is hard work. There is a point at, what, at which you have to sit down and go, okay, I am a writer, whether I feel the muse or not, I've got to sit down and get some words out. And mm. so I really appreciate you sort of mentioning that point that it is hard. There's um, many points. There's yeah. many points um, where you you sit down and then sometimes you have so much, like with then now always, I had two timelines going, you know, past and present day. And it's so overwhelming and you've just got to figure out how you can organize it. Some people organize it very well on the computer. I needed paper. I needed to draw a line and be like, this is one timeline. Here's the other timeline and then fill in the little pieces. So I could see where I could visually see where everything was going. Um, And that helped me feel not as overwhelmed by like literally the volume of story that was going on. Um, I, I'm, I'm a really big post-it advocate. I write everything on post-its, reminders, chapters, ideas. Um, I try to color coordinate. So if anybody who follows me on, on, um, social media, will see when I'm done a book, my office is covered in post-its. Um, and it's actually very, very satisfying to take them all down (laughs) when I'm done to take them all down and I have a clean slate and now it's time to breathe for a couple of days and then start the next project. Yeah, yeah. And and it's only, I think only by doing that, by doing multiple projects, do you get to understand what your own process is and how it works? And so now you know, oh yeah, I always do this, but I don't need to worry too much because three weeks before deadline, it'll all come together. And there's a sort of trust process there. Yes, trust yourself. (laughs) Oh, that's so funny. so you do have a lot going on. I'd love for you, though, to tell us about your latest book, um, The Business Between Them. Tell us about that. Um, who, who's that story about and who would enjoy the story? So The Business Between Them is uh, the fourth in my Once Upon a Wedding series. Um, it highlights uh, Rina and Akash. And it is my very first enemies to lovers trope that I wrote. They were actually lovers, enemies to lovers, back to lovers. So in the book previous to this, uh, and you don't have to read them in order, but just to give you a little background, um, the book previous to this one was The Runaway Bride. And so the woman, uh, the man that the bride gets actually ends up with is um, Rena's brother. And uh, Rena has a hotel. It's her parents' hotel. And she's a businesswoman. And the hotel is sinking and it's dying. And she thinks that, um, so she uses her brother's sort of fake relationship to kind of help build up um, the hotel by getting um, an influencer's wedding type to come to her hotel. Things don't work out. And on the secret, she's having an affair, having a relationship with Akash. So at the end of the the other book, her idea falls apart and now the hotel is not going to be saved and she's going to have to give up what she feels is her legacy. And um, she does something. She does something bad um, in the book before where she um, was about to let this influencer marry a uh somebody who was cheating on her just so that the wedding would happen and the influencer is actually her boyfriend's sister and when he finds that out in chapter one he breaks up with her in the new book so they work together and then they have this sort of conflict and they're apart and now he is actually the one who's saving the hotel for her so now she's really mad about it because she's like i don't need your help I can save this hotel by myself. And now she kind of works for him. Um, And so they're forced together um, in this working relationship where their personal relationship is theoretically over. And that's, so anybody who likes that kind of tension, that's what's there. (laughs) That sounds fun though. And I love, it sounds quite glamorous because you've got this big hotel, you've got influencers. It all sounds good fun. Yeah. Have family, like families, um, all of if if anybody's read my books, all of my books are a lot of family involvement. Um, 
So, um, and, and all of the char the characters, you can trace them back in, in the series um, to somebody and you'll so get little cameos from like, like the catering couple will show up every once in a while and you know, that kind of thing. So um, that's but, nice. Yeah. So that's what the, that came out in June. Yes. Okay. So where are we now? We are film filming. We are recording in September. Okay. So you've probably got something coming out fairly soon, I would imagine, or are you? I, I do. I have um, their accidental honeymoon coming out in December and in the book, that was the runaway bride. She left a groom sitting in the Mundup and um, the, their accent honeymoon is the groom story. Okay. And that is a best friends to lovers. Also a fake relationship uh, trope in that one. And that comes out at the end of December. Oh, exciting. Just in time for Christmas, just in time for Christmas. <laughs> so you're working on that now. Um, and so, so much going on, as we've mentioned, you've given us a little bit of insight into your process and into the sort of um, what's going on behind the scenes. But I'd love to know when you are feeling stuck, when you are kind of thinking, oh, I'm just not in the mood today, but I know I've got this deadline coming. What is What are the little tricks that you use on yourself just to keep yourself going, keep yourself motivated when... You may be feeling what I call the wall of resistance come up and you think, oh, I'm just not in the mood today. What are your tricks? Oh, there's so the tricks kind of depend because there's so many ways to procrastinate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so like some days, if it's just that, you know, um, I'm just not feeling it. Sometimes I just change my location in my home. So I where I am right now is my office. Um, I I tend to do most of my writing here. But if I'm not feeling it, sometimes I'll just take my computer and go cuddle up on the sofa next to my doggy. And I might write something new that day if I have a, if I have a new scene to write. Um, but if I'm really not feeling it, I may just go back and read what I've written um, and see and like maybe, you know, polish it up. I tend to write. Um, it's not gorgeous when I write it. Like I just sort of Sometimes my drafts are like, and then he said this, and then she said this, and then this happened, and then this happened. It's really more of like a detailed outline than anything else. But if I know I'm going to keep certain scenes, I might expand them a little bit, like add in sort of the senses and and the the nice words and take off all of the tags and, you know, that kind of thing. If I'm just not feeling like if I don't have like a new scene that's coming to me, I'll work on another part of it. Um Sometimes if I'm stuck like that for a couple of days, like I don't have a new scene, like I just don't know what happens next. I, I call a friend and I'm like, you know, or I text them. I'm like, I need to set up a call with you in the next day or so. Um, I just want to brainstorm. I'm stuck where I am. I don't know what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that happens a lot. And I think that was another thing I learned as a writer is that you don't have to know your whole story all the time. I mean, every other profession collaborates. Like they ask people for help. Doctors ask people for help. You know, engineers ask people for help. Just because you ask someone for help doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a writer. It just means you're too close to your work. So I have people that I can call and say, hey, what are your thoughts on this particular storyline? What am I missing? What do you, what do you, um, rec you know, whatever. We just brainstorm for a little while. Um, and that's, that's writing. It doesn't have to be typing pages, right? It's, I took a few notes and, and, and then I let that mull and I, I see what happens. You know, I might write something that day about it. I might not. Um, those are my kind of like go-to things. Um, sometimes I might just look at another project or I might just sit and do like writing related emails or something, or do make graphics or do promo, you know, something else. There's so many aspects of your writing career. I might just hit one of those for a couple hours, you know, and get that done if the other part isn't working. The other thing you can actually do is give yourself a break and read. I find that as writers, as much as we're supposed to read, I feel like I don't read as much as I want to um, because I'm always writing. So Find out what you can read while you're writing and maybe read for an hour. Just fill yeah. that well. Fill, Watch your well. fill your well. Yeah. So, so I think there's a lot of things that you can do um, that just because you're not typing doesn't mean you're not writing. 
lovely so true so true and um, I do echo what you were saying there about you know not getting to read as much I follow a lot of book talk people and I think how do they read so much how are they getting so much written uh, read I do envy them being able to do that yeah lovely advice there um and people can take the little bits that resonate with them and um and help to kind of keep themselves motivated motivated and keep themselves going mona this has been a delightful conversation thank you so much i loved it just before we wrap up please do tell listeners and viewers where they can find out more about you and of course your books um, so I am on um, Instagram and that's at Mona Shroff author. And that's where I'm most active. I'm also, I have an author page on Facebook. Um, I have a slight presence on TikTok that I feel like I should hit more, um, in terms of book talk and everything, but I have recently, um, started a newsletter and I have a, I have a website and I want to say that if you go to my Instagram and then my profile, like there's a link, there should be like a sign up link for my newsletter. Um, it, I've only sent out two or three. I'm due to do one in a week or two. Um, so which was actually, you know, to speaking of hard, like writing things to do for some reason, the newsletter was the hardest thing <laughs> for me to get out. Um, but yeah, so I do. So there's there's a lot of different ways. Um, okay. To, to yeah. What I'm doing. Yeah, I'll be sure to link to those in the in the description. That's lovely. Thank you so much for your time and um, good luck with the new book. Thank you. It was so great meeting you, Emma. I had so much fun.